may have a monkey. Which tells us that they don't have to do 100% digestion of everything. So we know that they, they drop food, but they also pass undigested food. You can see the makam with a nut, a happy nut in its beak. And they, they're so inefficient at crushing it. That some of it, some of it will go through that system. So they, they, some of it goes through their system, they defecate it and it sprouts. Okay. From a veterinary point of view, you can see birds that have not digested 100% of their diet and the bird be clinically healthy and be healthy. Ten years ago, if a bird passed one bit of undigested food, oh my God, it was being So that's one important point from the clinical perspective. From a, a dietary perspective, they have not evolved to eat anything with sugar. Everything they eat in the wild is, is astringent and bitter. Even things as unpalatable as bananas are eaten green in the wild. When they have, and here, more, more green things. They will avoid, they will avoid. Look, there's ripe fruit here, right? But they're picking the green fruit. So they avoid eating ripe things because they've not evolved to digest the sugar. We find that in pet cockatoos, in pet cockatoos given a lot of fruits, apples and bananas and oranges, that aggression is worse than it is if their diet excludes fruits. From a clinical point of view, it means that a bird that is already hormonally active, that is aggressive. All of these sugars, all of these sugars in the diet make it even worse. So when, when, you, when you look at all the parrots, only a couple of species have evolved to eat fruit, and they all have unique characteristics. Naked skin along the beak, so it's naked, so the fruit juices do not stick. The others eat fruit green, so there's no liquid. So therefore, they're not dealing with the juice. And they come so they have unique skin, and they have or they have unique beak because they come from areas with no water. You can't be really tell here. But the beak, the beak on this conure is very broad. And the reason is, is that there is no water on the island it comes from. There's zero water. It can only get fruit and water moisture from ripe fruit. So it has a very large... So it has a very large beak and it has a very big tongue. It collects the fruit and then it crushes and it tilts back. There are grooves along the side of the beak so that the moisture can flow inside the body. So there are very few exceptions where they will eat uh, ripe fruit. They have evolved uh, 
Their, their mechanism, their body have evolved to face their diet. Glossies eat very tiny seeds. They must spend... In order for one bird to survive, it must spend six hours feeding. So if a bird has got to feed six hours to maintain itself, it must feed nine hours to be able to feed a chick. So the chick has to be alone a long time. That's why the chick is so much down, so that it can conserve heat. So that's You see how much down it has. It looks like a cotton ball. And then they have evolved. Diet is so important in their life that they have evolved strategies as their environment has changed. In Brazil, cows eat the palm seeds green. So, but the palm seeds are so hard they can only digest the outside. It's like a date. You eat the date and you spit out the seed. The cows eat the date and defecate the seed. <laughs> so the macaws follow the cows and pick through the dung to eat the seeds. <coughs> so diet is very important. And generally you find species where the diet is available. Burichi palm in the pair of macaws nesting. So they always look for unripe foods, uh, key, key resources, and readily available. And then what triggers them? <laughs> So they, they, there are key elements that stimulate breeding, which is generally an increase in fat, because they have to wait for fatty foods to be available so that they can satisfy babies. When you breed galahs and you have raised them, they're always screaming for food. Because they're not getting enough fat in the diet. <laughs> then many of their feeding habits are inherited. This palm cockatoo is eating a banana <laughs> They know how to eat these very specific foods genetically. They don't learn it. It's in their genetic code to be able to eat it. Okay. Which is a new understanding. Clearly the beaks evolved to feed on very specific items, but also their genetic code uh, has the knowledge to be able to extract <laughs> So, some species are impervious to Klebsiella, for example, in Pseudomonas, because they have evolved to eat on the ground where it's most prevalent. You know, Klebsiella is very common in soil. They don't catch it. So they're, they're species that feed on the ground. Like these red fronted macaws in the area. Their, disease, their risk to getting diseases is very different than something. That feeds, that feeds in the trees. And then some species 
have adapted to eat a very poor diet, and they eat protein. So, so they will eat animals. Kias are notorious for eating dead animals, and Kakarikis will feed on penguins because they come from islands where there are penguins. Hello. So we need to understand that one diet doesn't fit everybody, but you need to adapt the diet depending on the species. That when they eat toxins, hello. Hi, how are you? When they eat uh, toxins, they evacuate the toxins by eating bark. You haven't missed anything. When I get to diet, that's when it's important. We're just touching on parrots in general. Or they eat, they eat lichens. This is a rose faced parrot. They eat very toxic plants. And then they immediately eat the lichens combined with the alkaloids. So so, how do we apply what we know? One, that you need to understand that um, the dietary needs of the species that you keep, you need to have an understanding, and there is no diet that fits everybody. Fat, animal protein, and many things are fat. This hyacinth, for example, was fed the wrong fat and it developed fatty tumors because its body could not digest pure coconut oil. The owner thought it was doing it a favor, so it would pour coconut oil. That diet can influence sex. So if you have pairs that produce too many males or too many females, you need to either reverse the diet or you need to balance it so you get an equal sex ratio. So, so if your diet Maybe your diet. Is there any uh, special formula for this? How you can. Yes. So what happens is you adjust the diet based on what sex you're getting. If you're getting 50 50, well, you don't play with it. If you're getting 70 30 or 80 20, there's a problem. So the richer the diet, the more males you will produce. So higher fat, meaning lots of high protein, high fats, lots of good things. It will produce more males. If you reduce your protein level and you reduce your fat, you produce more females. And it's genetically, it's, it's it has an explanation, a biological, because in times of poor food, you need more females to survive. I, I, we have not seen no. any change caused by water pH, by humidity, by temperature. It does. We, we deal with 100% humidity. Uh, and I, I have some pictures, I'll show you in my 
اللي بكتيريا تدخل اللي بكتيريا يعني بون دي مال بون دي مال ها هو كي يحطوا في كوفوز وما يزيدوا سواء في التمبيراتور شي بون دي مال هاو كامز ذات وين يو هاف يو جوت ميلز كوفوز كيفاش كيفاش تو ميلز كوفوز الكوفوز يا في تمبيراتور معين في اربع بليس دو مال ولا لا تمبيراتور معين في اربع بليس دو مال No, that's only in reptiles. We don't. We've never been able to prove that. We've never been able to prove it in reptiles. Yes, you can change the sex by temperature. You can't inherit. The threshold for incubation is much narrower in parrots. You can go 37.3, 37.4. Beyond that, you can have a lot of loss. <coughs> so it's clearly linked by diet, and you see it uh, in not only in captivity, but also the wild fox. So uh, that, then, uh, obviously, you need clean. Where you have rodents, you have problems. Where you have wild birds, you have problems. But you also need to be to understand that a bird only needs about 10% of its diet, of its body weight and food. This was in Russia, and they were feeding this for one ringneck parrot. And, and I bought a billion rats. In fact, they had so many rats that the rats would go there and rub themselves on the food like they were getting a spa. We, we, we monitor the amount of food our birds get based on their weight. So I have workers that take care of my birds. They have a measured amount, and the bird they get 10% of that bird's weight. Now that 10% depends on the density. 10% pellets is very different than 10% seeds. 10% nuts is very different than 10% pellets. Yes, calories are very different. We, we give our birds lots of natural foods, and we can use foods to, to breed birds. The blue-eyed cockatoos, there were nine pairs in the U.S. I bought two pairs. And the birds, when I got them, one was at one end of the cage and the other one was at the other end of the cage. They did not know each other existed. There was no recognition. So, what we did, these are coconuts. We have them all over the place. So we took a drill. We would drill a hole in the coconuts. And we would put the food inside the coconut. So if they were going to survive, they had to pull out the food out of the coconut. Do you understand? The birds were like this. The birds were here and here. I needed them to do this. So bringing them together, I did it with food because their their instinct to survive had to kick in. So, I would drill holes in my coconuts and we would put the food inside the coconuts. So, that immediately brought the birds together and we started to bring them like this. So that is eating a piece of coconut. 
Okay. Sometimes coconuts grow little balls of coconut inside. If they were going to work, if they were going to survive, they have to work together. So food can be used for many things. But, but remember, they spend about 40 to 60% of their day looking for food. In a cage, so we're we removing all that. So you need to get that bird to stop pulling feathers or stop chewing itself, you need to give it something to do. Something to do means giving it old books for it to chew up. Giving it branches, giving it. Uh, you have a lot, a lot of. You have a lot of palm trees here. You can give them the seeds of any of those palm trees. So, from a clinical perspective, you're a veterinarian. Somebody would bring me a bird in, pluck it, that's pulling its feathers. I would look at diet. I would look at enrichment, giving it something to do. If it's a species from a high rainfall area, eclectus, for example, African grays, I would do a skin biopsy for, for fungus. A skin biopsy for fungus. A skin biopsy, okay. And I would try, and if, if nothing would work, I would put in a hollow periodon, which is an anti psychotic drug, to calm it, make it sleepy. You know what halopirindol is? No. It is a drug given to people that are <laughs> edgy. It calms them down. It's much too young for me. It's called halo. No, 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 it's very different. It's halopirindol is a liquid. I know it is used sublingual in humans. And the idea is to calm down the stress on the bird. Okay. To at least give you time to figure out alternatives. Mm -hmm. With males that are very aggressive. And here you don't have a lot of pet We deal with thousands of pet cockatoos that become so aggressive during the breeding season that they attack the owners. Here you can use the value put directly in the yes. We can't get liquid value in the US. So, yeah. you know, it's always different. But yes, in, in that. The advantage to holopyridol is you can put it in their water. Okay. It's an antipsychotic. And you don't have issues here with a lot of pet cockatoos that are very aggressive. Because I don't think people here, you don't produce the number of cockatoos that we have produced. And these cockatoos become very hormonal. They attack. I have a Moluccan cockatoo. The woman read on the internet that you gave the bird a cardboard box to play in. The bird was very aggressive, he would stalk her. So she read some idiot wrote on the internet that you give the bird a cardboard box. She went and got a cardboard box and put it inside the cage. The bird started shitting inside the cardboard box. So, so the box got very dirty. She went in to take it and the bird attacked her. 
She had 57 stitches across her face. So they had to sew her. What space? What space? No, 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 Malukan. Ah, Palm much easier to manage. When you get birds like that, you do a Lupron implant to calm them down. You don't give them a card. You know what Lupron is? It's an implant, a hormonal implant. No, no, we don't have. You know that's what you do. You don't give the bird a card for box. You can also use Lupron. Let's say he buys a pair of cockatoos, red vented cockatoos, very aggressive species. The female is one year old, the male is five years old. You put them together and he's going to kill her. Guaranteed he's going to kill her. So what you want to do is you want that female to mature near the male. So what you do is you put a, a Lupron implant in the male. Okay, they will not breed with an implant. So you have two but options. You have three options. You leave them and risk the male killing the female. You put a, a, a hormonal implant for three years to give her a chance to mature, or you buy something. I don't know. I don't know here, but in Europe there are there are <coughs> that prevent you from bisecting a bee. And I don't know whether you can legally do it. And it's a clinical issue. And what you do is you split the lower mandible. You see the cut. So with very aggressive nails, you cut the bee. What it does is when he bites down, it opens up. You know, I don't know whether legally, whether legally it would be allowed to be done or not. In Europe, it's called and, yes, and you can't do it. Well, it's illegal. Well, it's illegal. 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 But don't have anything. So you don't have the words to deal with. Yeah. 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 Don't have no, don't have the product. You know, uh, I, I, I will regret it. I, I work for a company. We have offices worldwide. So I've been going to China. For decades. Ten years ago, the only thing you ever saw was a little songbird. Today, there are they are consuming huge amounts of birds, exotic birds. So there's just one, one breeder alone's projection is ten thousand pairs of macaws. So what I'm telling you is, come ten years from now. I'm sure you will have all these birds. Because bird keeping is like this. So that. So, hello. So you don't have one diet that fits everything. You have one diet that requires modifications for different species. We know that macaws need fat. Without fat, they don't. I Look, I was I was discussing something with you earlier now. In the U.S. Bird breeding really started in the 1970s. There was a television program of a cop, of a police officer, with a talking cockatoo. 1976. There had been very little interest in birds up until that time. Primetime television, 7 p.m. 
200,000 200 million homes in the U.S. were watching this guy with a pink cockatoo. The cockatoo would answer the telephone. Do you, do you have, do you have, pull up Beretta. B-A-R-E-T-T-A. Can you pull it? Do you have internet here? I don't have internet. B-A-R-E-T-T-A. So, so. <coughs> I know I want um, I want Google and Beretta. Translate. No, not translate. I want to see uh, a television program called Beretta. So, 1976, this television program comes on. We went from importing 10,000 birds a year to 7 million birds a year. So, we went from importing 10,000 birds a year to 7 million birds a year. Everybody wanted, everybody wanted a Beretta. We soon realized that we were killing 40-50% of these birds a year. It came to the point that it became very evident that most of the diseases were dietary related. That we needed to address diet to reduce mortality. So we were able to reduce mortality maybe 70% simply by improving the diet. And that is why a pelleted diet came on the market. Pellets, you call it uh, extruded, uh, what do you call it? Granulated. Granulated. That reduced mortality by 70%. Because so many of the diseases were dietary related. I don't like red. I don't advise that you give right fruits. And I don't advise that you give right fruits. Because look, what are they eating? They're eating green. Bananas. Have you ever eaten oh, a green banana? Yeah. They get used to it very quickly. You reduce you reduce. You reduce. Look, if they eat green things in the wild, they don't eat, they've not evolved to handle the sugar. Uh, we have seen bromelain toxicity from pineapple. In Banana, <laughs> in Banana, 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 I've seen 87% in the wild. I've caught malaria. I've caught enteritis. I have never seen a wild parrot eat a ripe banana. It is an artifact of there is no perfect diet that 
you have to bury the key. The in terms of percentages, uh, how, uh, how, how many percentage nuts, how many percentage seeds, how many percentage Protein. fruits? So what I would do is I consider we use granulated because we want our birds to get certain elements that they need. Our, we, we use granulated that have zero sugar. We don't want the sugar. Uh, and we feed 60% granulated across the board for everybody. And we breed things from palm cockatoos, uh, hyacinth macaws, to uh, broader Jerry's parakeets. We breed roughly 70 to 80 macaws, big macaws, every year. We breed 70 to 80 Amazons. We breed 70 to 80 cockatoos, and the rest are golden conures and hawkheads. So, 60 to 60% granulated. The Amazons will get 40% vegetables. The macaws will get 20% vegetables and 20% nuts. The conures will get 60% pellets, 40% vegetables. When we want them to breed, we play with a diet. You need to go from a poor diet to an enriched diet. So we have pellets that are maintenance with very low protein and breeder. Excuse me. And for the fat. We boost the fat by using oil directly on the pellets. Okay. We're gonna, we're gonna mix them with uh, with seeds. What we do is we buy. Um, we can get palm oil. We can get coconut oil, okay. and we can get <coughs> any type of oil. We put a spray bottle. You know what a spray bottle is? Yeah. So we lay our pellets on a cookie sheet and we spray the oil on the pellets. Why? Because we live in a super... Can you, can you pull up the slide, the photos that I had at the presentation on the pen drive? What photos? I brought some photos. There's some photos in there. In the flesh line. It's important for you to understand the environment that we live in so that you understand why we do things the way we do. So, this is, huh? sorry, I don't understand the French, so I can't help you. So, this is my place. We have 100% humidity eight months of the year. We have four to six hours of rain during those eight months. We can't use anything that will grow bacteria. This gives you another picture. We have to press the water. This is walking into the bird area. We have to pressure wash everything because if it you don't, everything will become green with, with fungus. All of our cages have to be off the ground because of flooding. We have everything on an automatic watering system. Could you repeat? Yes. So, <laughs> So, you saw the work of pressure washing. This is 
one week of mold. Could you put carcere, Rick? Mold. Sydney. Fungus on the side. You see it? El pase. <laughs> It is, it is mold. Mold grows ah, in very much. So we have to pressure wash constantly. We have to have everything off the ground because of rain and flooding. Because the rain can carry a lot of, a lot of material. We use an automatic watering system, so the birds never drink the rainwater. So it's a nipple, and the birds squeeze it and drink water from there. We have everything very open to the environment because we need airflow. We want airflow. We want absolute airflow. Airflow. Because if we don't, fungus will grow on, on, on everything. We need there to be dry. We're keeping the birds in a, in a very wet climate. You know, everything grows very fast because of the humidity. If we have to provide shade to block out noise, for example, for the African parents, we use a cloth that is coarse that still allow airflow. And I'm going to get back to your question. So you see, we've got a lot of a lot of tree growth that we deal with. And why do we need so much tree growth? Because we are in a hurricane area. Winds block hurricanes. Plants block. Um, everything has to be tiled and cleaned. This is our clinic. It's bigger than it looks. Um, I don't know if there's any other. And we have to have a clinic because we are in a hurricane area. Two years ago, we were hit by a hurricane. We could not get out of our house for nine days. We could not get out of our house for nine days. We had no electricity for 13 days. We need to be prepared for a crisis. And you lost some birds? I will tell you something that I have not discussed. Uh, don't put this on, on YouTube. <laughs> So I have 300 birds, about 150 pairs. We brought in half the birds, and we left half the birds in their cages. We took blood before and after from about 100 birds. Because there's something called cortisol. You know what cortisol is? It's used to measure stress. Blood cortisol levels. So we were subjected. <laughs> we were subjected to winds of 125 miles per hour. I don't know how many. Uh, can you check? 125. So you guys deal with kilometers. So. We were, we were subjected to 200 kilometers per hour winds sustained, meaning that it's not shh, but it would come. It's like a wave for 29 for 29 hours. When we were done, the cages are built so that the wind goes through. So it's not a problem. We didn't lose any cages. When we were done, we lost birds 
that died from stress indoors. We did not lose any birds that were outside in the hurricane. And the cortisol levels were normal in the birds outdoors. They went crazy on the birds indoors. Do you understand? So this was really built as a security, as an additional security. Security. <laughs> we, we have, we have uh, Klebsiella in our water, it is inherent in our water, so we have to treat the water with um, reverse osmosis. So it's reverse osmosis, there's ultraviolet here, ozone here, and you don't have And then it goes to a tank, and we have to bleach the tank. We have to get chlorine into the tank and kill the plastic. <laughs> Uh, uh, filter. You, you, you change the we change the filters every three months. <coughs> every three months. <coughs> because of Giardia in the water. Yes. So it's in the water. There's nothing I can do to stop it. It's in the water.